<laughs> Greetings, everyone. It's me, Dr. Paul Gerhardt, and uh, this is DBA 605 at City University. We are having our second live seminar, and today's topic is basic leadership theories. And uh, we've got a handful of our top doctoral students in our elite program here today. Um, why don't we go down the line and uh, turn your mic off when you are not talking and turn it on when uh, when you have a question or have something that you'd like to share and why don't we start with Miss Miller here on the on my right would you uh, say a quick introduce yourself and tell us what you hope to get out of our class quickly Deb can you hear us All right, Deb, I can't hear you if you are on. Um, well, I apologize. Let's go to Tanya. Would you uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you're getting out of the, what you would like to get out of our class? Hi, Dr. Gephardt. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what I would like to get out of the class is basically to help me with organizational development, Great. organizational period. It's like organizing things, you know, and what better place to organize than your workplace. So I'm excited just with what I've been learning so far with this course. And you've been awesome. So thank you for your contributions, Tanya. Who's next? Introduce yourself quickly and tell us what you want to get out of the program, out of this class. Someone is trying to log in. All right. I need someone to introduce themselves and, and uh, tell us what they'd like to get out of the class. This is Brad. Uh, who, who, who is this? This is Brad. Hi, Brad. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I have a visitor here again. There awesome. <laughs> So I'll try to keep it on mute so when she barks, you won't hear it. But uh, I like to get out of the class. Oh, no, I, organizational development is scary because the only thing constant is change. Yeah. So I'm really going to be true. Corporations and organizations need to change in order to stay relevant. Yep, I, I agree. Thank you very much. Again, uh, be uh, cognizant if your microphone is on or off. If you have something that you want to share, go ahead and turn your microphone on. And uh, when you're not talking, make sure you put it on mute. Anyone else want to introduce themselves before we get into the theory today? I'm not sure if anyone else wants to introduce themselves. Um, okay, I won't. I won't. I, lost it, guys. I don't know when I lost you. I'm back though. Oh, thanks, Brad. Pre appreciate it. All right, Deb. I can see your lips moving, but your microphone isn't on. I can't reach anywhere. I'm trying to get the. I got no sound. I can hear somebody saying they don't have any sound. Okay, so. Um, Looks like we're having some technical difficulties. So we'll try the introduction thing on the next video, you guys. Or if you want to chime in anytime after uh, we get going, we certainly can do that too. So um, let's get going on the theory and um, we'll get things worked out. It's part of the learning process anyway. So uh, these theories um, are taken out of maybe a book that you've studied in your gradu other graduate program. Uh, Nordhaus is the king of theory and he starts out talking about trait theories and there are many trait theorists out there. Stogdill probably is the most famous out of all the um, trait theorists and many uh, researchers say that trait theory is dead. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the fact that uh, 
even though there is no proven set of traits that work for every single situation, it's important to understand that uh, trait theory is a theory that uh, you can use to be able to identify the necessary characteristics, uh, leadership traits of a leader for a specific team. So that leader should have the ability to manage a specific team. And uh, that essentially is what trait theory has done. And there are hundreds of studies done on trait theory, and all of them pretty much point out uh, the fact that there isn't any one set of, of traits. But uh, when working with my clients, um, what I have found is, believe it or not, the leaders usually are the main reason why there's organizational dysfunction. And it's about leaders really being in touch with their employees and what's going on in their organization. And that's what's important about uh, understanding leadership theory. It's about being able to have the right tools to pull out to help a client understand where he or she may be playing a part in any kind of organizational dysfunction. And so uh, this uh, presentation really is about helping you have a better foundation about leadership traits. So with trait theory, we know that there is no specific set of traits that appear to be uh, needed in every single leadership situation. But one of the one of the things that people constantly bring up is in order to be a leader, you uh, you must have followers. And so supervisory ability really is an effective um, constant trait for instance for for leadership and if you are trying to help an organization find or build uh, teams that are efficient and effective and these are key words in OD is it's your goal to help managers make sure they maximize um, what it what an organization does maximize profit maximize profic efficiency and help people become proficient um, that means you got to have the right people in the right places and so you got to be able to I know what to look for in identifying leaders with the right traits and so I double dog dare each of you to consider your own leadership traits you know be able to really sit down and ask yourself what is it that I'm good at you can't be great at absolutely everything but just like in marketing um, the the leadership traits that you may have may be able to be what you uh, are can use to leverage to help make any kind of organizational dysfunction better uh, going back to the basics um, there are essentially three basic leadership styles and uh, they all have their right place at the right time and we're laying down a foundation for the rest of these leadership theories by mentioning these. For instance, autocratic leadership is all about um, the leader making all the decisions and um, as bad as that may sound, for larger organizations or teams, it really takes one person calling the shots. If you can imagine being a part of a very, very large team and it was a democratic type organization and everybody wanted to make a decision, um, things probably wouldn't get done. So being, ha being an autocratic leader making decisions has its right place at the right times. And um, we can all be autocratic leaders at the right times and we can be democratic leaders at the right time and then we can be laissez-faire leaders at the right time, but it's about pulling out the right tool at the right time. Democratic is about involving other people in the decision-making process. The leader still gets to ultimately make the final decision, but um, a wise leader practices democratic uh, leadership because they don't always know what they don't know. And so as we'll continue to talk about, trust is the glue of all relationships and, and leaders need to give trust to followers in order to get trust. And part of giving trust is about involving people in making decisions, asking people questions and showing that their, their opinions really are being considered and utilized. Um, they don't have to use them 100% of the time. They're ultimately responsible and they often know more than what their constituents know. But 
um, they still have to take the time and show the respect to followers that their ideas are being considered. And if not used at that time, maybe they'll be used at a later time. Laissez-faire is, is, is kind of a non-leadership style, but a necessary one. You know, there is a time for a leader to keep their hands off when they need to and just empower people to make the best decisions possible. When you have a team of highly effective people who are very, who have been proven competent and systems are in place uh, to uh, be controls over minimizing losses and uh, allowing people to be as autonomous as possible as needed for speed sake, that's when a hands-off approach or laissez-faire is important. It's not appropriate at all times and in all situations, but when you're working with high caliber people who are, have, have proven themselves in their jobs to be highly effective, it is probably the best uh, approach to leadership in the right situations. Going back in time, uh, there were uh, several studies going on at the same time in Michigan and Ohio uh, primarily where uh, leadership scholars were really starting to take a look at what is leadership. And this is what I've found as a scholar myself is uh, theory really is all about identifying natural phenomena that takes place and then developing models that explains it. And so this is a model that uh, is used to, to take a look at um, behaviors of employees and it's related to task. And so this theory suggests uh, that uh, leaders, leadership style is st stays essentially the same and that you hire a leader based on a team. And so, um, depending on what type of team that you're leading will depend on what type of leader you hire and put in place and, and train to be a certain way. Uh, consideration and structure are all about relationship and task. So, when you have uh, a leader, if you look in the first quadrant there in the upper left hand corner, high consideration and low structure, that really is about recognizing that um, employees don't have to get things done at a high pace, but relationships really matter. And what comes to mind is like a hospital administrator working with highly skilled um, surgeons. You know, they need to make sure that they are um, being, you know, considerate and respectful and helping those support their employees, but um, not necessarily getting their hands involved in what it is that their employees do. Uh, hi. Yes. Tanya Parker question. Yeah. Is there any way you can slightly uh, make the screen a little bit larger as far as the the text yeah um they're real not that i'm well maybe but it'll mess up i it, right it will it will mess up the recording oh okay so I, i'll That's try great. yeah better. thanks for asking uh low consideration low structure uh has to do uh, with uh being less employee centered and less task oriented high structure and high consideration um, probably like fast-paced teams, things teams that need to get a lot of things done. And I imagine like restaurants, for instance, where uh, employees need to be uh, customer-oriented, so leaders need to be employee-oriented, but they still have to get a lot of things done. And then high structure, low consideration. I consider this like a, a sweatshop type situation. We're going to talk about that here in a second. But high structure, low consideration, fast paced work, go, 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 very directive approach. So um, really recognizing uh, in each of these theories, it's about having the right style of leader, doing the right things for the particular situation. And they don't all work. And it could cause problems 
if uh, leaders are not applying the right style of leader and in in this uh, two-dimensional leadership model it's just assumed that the leader's style is generally stagnant and the same um, throughout his or her career this next theory came around in the 1970s and it used to be called the Mouton uh, Blake managerial grid but the as time progressed we we moved away from the term managerial because we recognize that managers are the ones that are really working with systems they're work like they're doing budgeting and ordering and directing and um forecasting and scheduling whereas a leader is really more about the people side of things and so leaders are, are leading people inspiring a vision creating a vision aligning people and so that's what's really important is if if managers have people that report to them they absolutely need to be a leader and they need to recognize uh, what the needs of their followers are and be able to apply uh, the right style of leader. Uh, this uh, Mouton Blake uh, leadership grid really kind of maps, takes that two dimensional model to the next level and shows uh, on a scale from one to nine, nine being high, one being low in areas for concern for people versus concern for production. And it's kind of a simplistic approach to look at it. Uh, that way but it really is important for whatever organization that you may be working for or with as a consultant that you help them realize how they may be negatively impacting a team by having the wrong style of leader or, or be applying the wrong approach to leadership and so take a look at each of these different areas there is a right area for each of these in a wrong area uh, to apply each of these leadership theories. For instance, authority compliance, nine, high in production, one, low in concern for people. I found it over here. Anyway, so uh, as you look at authority compliance, that really is what we would call sweatshop management. Yeah, uh, the slide says efficiency in operations results from arranging conditions of work in such a way that human elements interfere to a minimum degree. And I, uh, when I do my leadership workshops or training leaders, uh, I often joke about that kind of looks like this. Hey, Bob, what the heck are you doing? Speed up. I see that you cut your finger off. Put that darn thing in your pocket and wrap it up and get back to work. You know, and that's how I kind of imagine authority compliance. In, a, in a, a workplace where you're dealing with people where production matters, you pretty much have to be a, an authority compliant leader. Because can you imagine taking a country club approach in a sweatshop? It would look something like this. Hey, Bob, how's it going today? How's the wife and kids? Ah, uh, you're you're only here about thirty minutes late today. That's all right. Can I get you a cup of coffee? It's sure nice to see you today. I can't wait for the rest of the employees to start working today. I'm sure it's going to happen sometime. Did you hear if it's going to rain today? So, if you are in a competitive market where production really matters, having that kind of approach probably wouldn't be so effective. But can you imagine being in a, a situation like a hospital where you were a hospital administrator and you're, you're looking at the numbers and you're going, oh my gosh, we're only doing nine brain surgeries a week. I'm going to get on Dr. Bob right now. Dr. Bob, come to my office. You're only doing nine surgeries. What the heck is going on? We've got a business to run here. If you're not doing 25 surgeries by the end of this week, I don't care how great you are. You're out of here. That type of leadership probably isn't going to work. And of course, I'm dramatizing uh, what that looks like. But um, in a situation like 
a hospital where you're dealing with highly talented people, you probably want to take a more little more hands-off approach and help people feel comfortable. And that's why, like in a country club, like where you'd go golfing, things are a little um, need to be a little more friendly or a lot more friendlier than that. So um, this slide says thoughtful attention to the needs of people for satisfying relationships leads to comfortable, friendly organization atmosphere and work tempo. And so that's one concern for production, nine concern for people. Um, down in the bottom is impoverished management. And that slide says 1-1, one, one, low concern for people, low concern for production. Uh, exertion of a minimum effort to get required work done is appropriate to sustain organizational membership. So um, can you guys think of any environment where that style of leader would be appropriate? All right, I need a 10-page essay paper about that by the end of the week. How about middle of the road? So, I was going to say the impoverished management is kind of, I don't know of any industry either, but that doesn't seem like it's very efficient. Yeah, it really isn't. That's kind of a figurehead, if you think about it. And sometimes I think about like nonprofits. For instance, you've got nonprofits are extremely hard to manage because you've got such um, you're paying low wages to most of your people if they're even getting paid at all. And then you have um, you have people who are coming in because they're wild about saving the kids or feeding the homeless or um, providing shelter or something, whatever the organization is all about. But yeah, if you go and you start telling people how to do their job, people are like, are you kidding me? I have a master's degree. I could go someplace else and get paid three times more than this. So um, sometimes having a hands-off approach is really kind of the best that you can do in a situation where you're dealing with um, people who, um, you know, have other choices, for instance. And so... Uh, most people want to go to work and make a positive difference, and that's one of the most important ideas behind uh, organizational development. And when people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, it's probably because it cause and effect. You know, a leader has failed to provide the right type of leadership for a person or not listen to a person at the right time or not... Um, supported a person in the appropriate way and little things can turn into very big things and one person truly can make a difference in the long run and short run we're going to talk about emotional intelligence um, in one of our uh, live seminars and that really is an absolute crucial uh, tool for uh, top leaders to have and leaders at every level but the higher up you go in an organization the more emotionally intelligent you need to be um, middle of the road management is really where I think we are in academia um, we at City University have to maintain our accreditation this doctoral program that you are in we have big plans for it we want your degree to be seen as extremely credible and so we need to be making sure that we are doing everything we can to make sure we're maintaining high and clear standards and at least as good as our competitors if not better and so I know that it kind of feels a little icky when I say hey you didn't quite meet that standard and I know that everybody in here is smart but at the same time if we pretended to meet standards that weren't really met our reputation of excellence would be shy of being excellent and so um, I try to be as gentle as I possibly can but we still you know I'm still a member of a team that I can't afford to be the weak link on and so with middle of the road knowing that uh, deans don't want to lose great professors they need to kind of be gentle too. Paul we need to make sure that we're following the rubric 
the rubrics have these specific things in there. Would you make sure that our students are meeting the uh, standards of our rubric, please? Yes, I certainly will, sir. So um, it's kind of kind of that way. If you push too hard, you lose a good employee. You don't push hard enough, you lose um, you lose a good employee, or you lose a, a system or a right or a privilege. We can't afford to lose our accreditation. Uh, we want all of our degrees at City University to be seen as the best of the best. And so um, in academia, and all, I'm sure this is probably true in most organizations, they kind of have to take a middle-of-the-road approach. And that 5-5 says uh, adequate organization performance is possible through balancing the necess necessity to work with maintaining morale of the people at a satisfactory level. So um, having clear standards, being gentle about how you approach uh, meeting those standards is kind of important. And the, and the deal with leadership, as you guys already know, is a leader sets the example for the organization and how they approach things. So leaders who are kind and gentle and thoughtful probably are treating stakeholders, have, having those employees treat stakeholders that way. Uh, leaders who uh, are straightforward and are focusing on numbers and always pushing uh, for more production probably have employees who are numbers oriented and pushing for more production. And uh, that's ideally according to the literature in most types of organizations, and I said most and not all, team management 9-9 is ultimately the goal. High concern for people and high concern for production. And that 9-9 in the top right-hand corner says work accomplishment is, is from committed people. Interdependence through a common stake in organization purpose leads to relationships of trust and respect. And so each of us has probably worked in an organization where efficiency and effectiveness are both being stressed. And especially today in today's global economy where uh, almost every organization has competitors who are looking for ways to be leaner and meaner. This is why um, I think it was Brad that was wisely reminding us that change is the only constant for any organization. And this is why we really think at City University, especially in this 21st century, that having a doctorate in organizational development uh, really helps you guys be able to know how to make organizations work better. And, and they, there's going to be a higher demand for experts who can help lead positive change. So, any... Yeah, please. Um, where do you, do you consider compensation, so salary or benefits or whatsoever, bonus or commission, to be a part of a concern for people? Or is that interdependent of a concern for people? So, for example... At Verizon, where I'm at now, I would say the concern for people is quite low. However, they have very low turnover because they're very generous with their compensation. Yeah, that's really an interesting concept. Um, I I would say that really is part of the 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 whole package because being a leader, um, acts acts and symbols are things that help shape a leader's image. So yeah, if a leader is endorsing, um, we give our, our employees are our best asset. We want them to have packages where their families are taken care of and have no worries about health and, and welfare. Absolutely. Um, as a leader, it, it also has to do with how you treat employees. How are you you building relationships and maintaining relationships. Do you see people as um, living human beings with lives and feelings, or do you see them as uh, people who punch a clock and they're only as good as their last bit of production? So that, I think that's a better look at it. But yeah, it's a really great point. Organizations today have to consider that if they want to have um, a competitive organization they have to be able to attract and maintain the best talent and if uh, you're paying the 
wages that are standard in the industry but your benefit package isn't up to par that may be the difference between getting someone who's going to help your organization maintain and grow or allow the competition to have it so I appreciate your your perspective Brad that's a great insight um, this is Hershey and Blanchard situational leadership model this is my favorite model because I think this is the one that every leader at every level of the organization who has people reporting to them really has to consider on a deep level um, if you notice the arrow at the top of this screen uh, has a D1 through D4 and it's pointing to a bullseye related to our task or goal. That's what's important about this. Because if you consider the employee, we're dynamic as an employee. And that means we get better at doing things the more we do things. But the very nature of today's workplace is we're doing more than one different task. We have lots of different responsibilities. So this theory from Hershey and Blanchard from the late 1970s and early 1980s suggests that as a leader we have to look at both the individual and the task the individual is working on. For instance, if you've had a, a veteran employee who's been working for you for 10 years and he or she is very very good at what uh, he or she does they're a D4 employee. They're highly competent and highly committed. They're, they're there. They're, 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 they're being a steward of their department and what they do. But say the company merges and new technology is brought in and that 10-year employee that you, you're working with has to learn how to use a new computer program. Well, that new employee for that particular task using that new employee program actually becomes a D1 here. And so according to this theory, uh, you need to be the director with this. So I'm going to walk you through this um, situational leadership model a little bit. Notice the, the colorations of the boxes on the top and the boxes on the bottom. Um, the box on the bottom, the bigger box, is all about the leadership style that matches the box at the top. So S1 is the style that the leader needs to be exhibiting. D1 is related to the employee uh, and, and the level of uh, the, that employee is at the task. So Tanya, quit yawning. Sorry. All right. So a, say you hire a brand new employee to work on the digit, the widget line. That employee has never made widgets before. She is a D1, according to this theory. And uh, as a D1 employee, they're low competence, but high commitment. Why would they be high commitment? anyone maybe because they're new they they want to you know really do a good job they just started they don't really know what to do or how to do it quite well yet but they have that commitment perfect thank you yeah absolutely yeah when you hire someone new they want to prove themselves they're highly committed so according to this theory you just need to be the director uh, you need to be taking the time to walk the person through what his or her tasks are step by step by step you're directing do this do this do this do this you don't have to be saying that's good awesome good work well you got it good work you know it's all you got to do is really focus your time and energy on being that director well so you got this employee they've been working on that widget line uh, for a couple of weeks now and they're doing the same thing over and over and over again they're getting kind of good at it because they've been doing it for a while whatever that task is and they're a D2 employee they're low sum comp competence and low commitment so you can see that they're low competence because they're not experts yet but why would they be low commitment you guys 
Maybe now maybe they feel like, hey, I think I figured it out so I can cruise now. Okay. And that's the employee that needs a little bit of encouragement. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And they may be like, oh, crap, this is a job. You know, and so work is starting to feel like work. So um, it's your job to recognize that that person needs some coaching. And so it's important. The, the one thing that I think most organizations fail at, from my experience, is that they fail to give constant feedback and come back through and say, you're doing this well, you're not doing this well, and you got to catch them at the right time. So there's no set amount of time, really, where you come back and do coaching. But you always have to be uh, helping people know as a leader when they're doing good so that they can continue doing good. And when they have areas for opportunity for improvement, you come back around and say, hey, Bob, what's going on? You, it looked like you really had this going. You don't seem to be uh, going as well. Is there something I can help you with? Or uh, I've been watching you do this. Can I show you an easier way to do that? I don't want you to get uh, tired here. But you're showing some interest in the person. You know, and you think of about um, sports. I'm not a big sports guy, but uh, sports analogies are really pretty awesome. I mean, you have to have a phenomenal coach to know what to say to the right employee at the right time to get them to do the right things. And so that's essentially what you're doing uh, as a coach. So that you've caught the employee at the right times and they've managed to stay with the company for about two years. And according to the literature, you're going to find that it really does take about two, uh, an employee about av on average, about two years to be as good as the person that he or she has replaced. And so once they've been at that job for a while and they're really becoming an expert, they're high to moderate competence. They've got everything down. Uh, they make mistakes every once in a while, but not very much. But now they've got variable commitment. Why? What's going on there? Well, they feel they have the they have confidence. It could be a false confidence too. That okay. They're the, that they're the best at it, and they can. You know, they might be able to meander off a little bit or don't have an answer to everything, even though they think they do. Sure, absolutely. Any other thoughts on that? That's true. They might also be at that point where they've been there a while, but they're watching other people. Maybe they're getting paid the same, but they're not doing as much work. So they're thinking like, yeah, you know, do I need to, what, what will it get me if I work harder? Do I see a future? They might be right in that spot where they don't know if they're going to move forward or should they kind of cruise right now? Yeah, you got it. Yeah, I mean, you really have to start thinking like an employee if you're going to be an organizational development consultant. And you're a coach to very, very smart people as, as an organizational development consultant. And so training them to really be able to, and this is about being empathetic, but see things uh, from the perspective of their other employees so that you can help them in making the decisions. Because in any organizations, it's the result of a leader's and employee's uh, choices that you get the best result. It's not what happens, but it's in the decisions that are made. And in everybody's career, uh, people start to, to want to um, be thinking about what are my possibilities? What should I be doing? This, this feels like, like a job, but can I do better than this? Or um, when is it going to be my time to grow with the organization and gain more responsibility? And so that really is your job as a leader, is you need to be the supporter. You don't have to tell a good employee who knows what he or she is doing for a particular task uh, how to do his or her job. But you do need to uh, help the employee recognize their own personal value. And that really is key. Um, everybody needs to recognize how what he or she does contributes to the overall success of the organization. And so um, 
That's about giving more responsibility and helping people see that they have a future with the organization. And you're being authentic about it, too. You know, you might say, Bob, Jane is going to die someday. And when she goes, you got her job. Of course, I'm being a little tongue in cheek. But whatever that looks like, it's ideally if we want to help uh, people be their very best. We need to help them find their way in their organization and get them the skills and support that they need in order to grow with the organization. Uh, after an employee's been with the company for a long time, and let's say back to 10 years uh, at doing a particular job and they're really, really good, they're a D4 employee, according to situational leadership. They're highly competent and they're highly uh, committed. And these are the people who should be in charge of training other people and have more responsibility in the organization. And so that's why, as a leader, you become the delegator, the S4. And um, it says low directive and low supportive. Because think about this. Let's say you are that D4 employee. You know you're the best in the industry. Uh, you've been there for a long time. You've proven yourself. You've paid your dues. Heck, the industry uh, uh, journals are coming to you and writing stories about you. And then your stupid boss, the vice president, comes down. He's got to earn his pay, of course. And he comes down and says, Bob, I see you're doing a good job there. I read the article about you in, in Widget Times, but... I think you ought to do what you're doing differently. Why don't you do it my way? Let me show you how to do your job the way that I think it should be done. All right, ladies and gentlemen, which finger on your hand is Bob, the D4 employee, going to be showing the boss? Yes, the middle one, probably. And the boss who tried to be a D1 uh, leader stepped out of line. He did the wrong thing, and he showed disrespect to that awesome D4 employee. So, um, you got to recognize that applying the wrong style of leadership could do damage. He just, uh, that vice president just damaged the trust and levels, that trust levels of that, that relationship with that employee. But, guess what? That scenario that I brought up with the, Companies merging just happened, and now Bob, who was the expert as the senior widget guy in North America, now has to learn a new software program that he has never had to use before. So you have to go back to Bob being a D1 employee, and you need to be the director if you are the expert using that software. So, can you see how? Uh, this is such a cool model to use. Guys, everyone shake your head. Yay. Okay, lots of smiles. I appreciate that. So, yeah, that's Hershey and Blanchard's situational leadership model. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, you probably heard this term all the time, but servant leadership truly uh, was becoming very, very popular. And um, it was originally um, coined by Robert Greenleaf, but a lot of the work in servant leadership in the late 1970s and then into the 2000s, believe it or not, was done by Larry Spears. And essentially, um, this theory really is all about recognizing that as leaders, if you learn to serve your employees, you're empowering them and treating them the way you, that you want them to treat their stakeholders. And so the 10 characteristics that you see here of a uh, servant leadership are listening, empathy, healing, awareness, persuasion, conceptualization, foresight, stewardship, commitment to the growth of others, and building community. And that's a pretty big list. But uh, if you think about in an organization, if you had leaders who were truly committed to helping their people be the very best they could and connecting people with their souls where they want 
to be the best that they can be because their leaders truly understood them. They made time to listen to them. They were aware of times when they need coaching and direction and help people see things in a much greater level. I mean, that's it's kind of inspiring to think about what could happen if everybody learned how to be a servant leader. So um, trust is uh, very fragile. Relationships are fragile, and trust is the glue of all relationships. Organizations are weaker when uh, people are working in silos or are scared uh, or don't know what or have to hide their mistakes because leaders uh, aren't understanding or um, lying takes place, and so there's lots of low levels of trust within the organization. So uh, leaders set the tone for culture uh, to help shape the culture and climate in organizations. And if you have a organization that is service oriented and the leaders are walking the walk and talking the talk, um, people tend to stay with the organization longer. That means keeping their talent in the organization and growing with the organization and helping find ways to make the organization even better because they're committed to it because leaders have earned that from their followers at every level so it's a pretty important uh, leadership theory to consider also in the 1970s uh, the world famous transformational leadership uh, model was born it was originally researched and wrote about by james mcgregor burns in his book called transformational leadership and then the work was taken on by the late great bernard bass who died just a few years ago and uh, bernard bass did the legwork in developing uh, the framework for an assessment uh, based on the work that he did and uh, James McGregor Burns did to help uh, analyze transformational leadership and transactional leadership styles to help people understand their styles. So that's really what uh, Bernard Bass did. And Bernard Bass's uh, company was called Mind Garden. So if you were interested in using the transformational leadership tool with your clients, go to mindgarden.com or you can Google, of course, transformational leadership. But essentially, uh, the MLQ-5, which was the tool that Bernard Bass uh, developed, was an assessment tool that's been scientifically validated and tested um, to be able to help uh, understand the different levels of transformational and transactional leadership. And part of that was inspirational appeal um, and characteristics of being proactive, democratic, um, promoting harmony. Um, those character four main characteristics he he coined as idealized influence, inspirational motivation, ide idealized consideration, and intellectual stimulation. Uh, what is important to recognize about transformational leadership is it really is meant to be used for top levels of the organizations, the E-teams of organizations, executive levels, because they seem to have the biggest impact. But it doesn't mean that leaders who are working in the mid-level or frontline can't be transformational leaders, but the studies uh, done and the intent for the transformational leadership tool really did focus on the top levels of the organization. And it is, I did my dissertation, by the way, using the MLQ-5, and it is a really interesting tool to be able to use for leadership training and development. You know, the ideally, just like I said for the other leadership styles, is you got to be using the right style of leadership at the right time. And if you understood what each of these dimensions of transformational leadership is about, you've got more tools in your pocket to be pulled to pull out at the right time. Uh, part of the transformational leadership theory is transactional leadership. So uh, Bernard Bass talked about both of these styles and the MLQ-5 measures transactional leadership. And in there, the dimensions that were measured really were about reward uh, being demonstrative, goal setting, and defining expectations. The newest literature 
on transformational leadership suggests that transformational leaders often use transactional style leadership in order to get um, change done. So transactional leadership is important. Transactional leadership is often used in lower levels of the organization. Do this and you'll get this reward. Um, here's my expectation, do this or else. And so um, that's essentially in a nutshell what transactional leadership is in a heartbeat. And the MLQ5 also measures laissez-faire as, as the third factor in that. So um, sometimes leaders need to be aware of the fact that um, they may be a, a hands-off leader when they really need to be a little more hands-on than they are. Or maybe they, uh, they're um, too transactional and they really need to trust that leaders are, um, that, that their employees really can be more effective if you allowed them to understand what your vision was and then you empowered them to make the right decisions. And we're going to talk more about that in our uh, seminar in two weeks where we're going to go over um, some more of the behavioral, specifically uh, motivational theories, because these things work hand in hand with each other, and you're constantly going to be listening to your clients or your colleagues, and you're going, oh, here's, here's a situation where this person should have done this instead of that, and that's really where we want to get you in our program, is you use the theories that you're going to learn at as diagnostic tools and prescriptive tools. So being able to diagnose, diagnose what's going on, using theory, pulling it out at the right time, and then prescribing the right prescription according to that theory that uh, goes with it. So it's really a powerful journey if you allow yourself to learn the theory. Uh, again, uh, these theories, if you don't have the book, uh, come from um, Peter Guy Nordhaus, um, brilliant writer, and he's just done a lot of research on these leadership theorists that I've been mentioning by name, and he's compiled them into an excellent book. Um, this final theory that we're going to talk about is the newest of the theories uh, in uh, Nordhaus's book, and it, it's uh, by Bill George, Authentic Leadership. And it is exactly what it sounds like, as most of these theories are. You know, it's about really a leader being truly in in harmony with his or his or her authentic self. It's about being self-reflective and self-aware and transparent in conversations about what they what they want. It, it's about building trust with employees and building your organization uh, by surrounding yourself with people who have similar values. And it what's really key about this leadership theory is that you really have to understand yourself first and be true to yourself before uh, you can do anything else. And when you're not happy, you need to help align systems uh, in order to help you be the very best you can be. Um, some of the best... Oh, Dr. Gear. Yes, sir. You, at, when at the end or whatever you set and post this up, this video, could you send that information or give us that information you get on the book you just mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. It would make a if you're anything like me. Uh, when I was in my doctoral program, I just bought every single book on every topic that I could find, and I've got bookshelves and bookshelves of books. So yeah, I'm happy to to post that that reference. It's definitely one that. Uh, you got to have, especially if you're going to be an organizational development consultant. Um, uh, Nordhaus. It is current. That's what I really like. Yeah, it's been updated. Um, when I was in my master's program uh, in the 90s, uh, they were using it. And he continues every year to update it and update it and update it. So it's, it's, it's gotten a lot thicker throughout the years. There's case studies in here to 
uh, help you be able to understand how to apply it. And there's also some diagnostic tools in there too, some personal assessments that kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. So you, you get a little taste of the MLQ-5, you know, what does that look like? Um, but yeah, it's definitely one of those tools you want to pull off the shelf and really get to know some of the ins and outs. And he does a good job of of doing scholarly writing, by the way. I mean, he's comparing and contrasting. He's talking about strengths and weaknesses in a critical thinking way. So, yeah, Peter Guy Nordhaus, and the book is called Leadership Theory and Practice. So definitely one to have, and I'll try to remember as I upload this PowerPoint for you to also leave you the, the reference for that so you can get it. And I'll, I'll link it to Amazon. I've spent Amazon should be giving me free books by now since I've been buying all this stuff from him. But yeah, it's the newest one. And it really is about, you know, I can imagine coaching a leader to say, what do you think? Why is this rubbing you the wrong way? You know, and so those are the kind of conversations that you should be having with your clients. Remember, as an organizational development consultant, you are being hired essentially to tell the top leader who is hiring you that he or she is right. And even when they're wrong, and it's usually their fault that problems are going the wrong way, you're carefully guiding them through a questioning process where they go, oh my God, that was my fault. How do you think I should fix that? And then you are replying back, oh, you're right. You're brilliant. Good job for recognizing that. Here's what I would do if I was in that situation. Let me tell you about authentic leadership. It's about being true to you and being transparent and always recognizing that you have to be honest with yourself and everyone else at the same time. Let's see what we can do to get this fixed. You know, it, you can be a hero um, by being an organizational consultant, but it, what I have found, it's about the quality of the questions that you ask. And it's about recognizing that you truly understand the theories. Um, don't, don't blow off theory because it sounds theoretical. Really use, I keep mentioning Evernote. I don't own stock in Evernote, by the way. But it's a cool tool that I use to this day as I'm putting together books. And I'm writing all the time or I've got presentations stored in Evernote if someone needs a presentation off the bat or if someone needs an article about something like, oh, yeah, I wrote that about that. Let me let me email that to you. And I've got it stored in Evernote in file folders. So um, it's really a powerful tool that I highly recommend every doctoral student have, especially if they're planning on using what they're learning to work with clients. And you got to be adding value all the time when you're working with clients. Find ways to give free stuff to them all the time so that they're getting more than they bargained for all the time. Ideally, you want to work with a client you know, forever in a day, constantly being there and being so good at what you do that your clients are recommending you to other people. And so finding ways to constantly add value truly is how you become successful. Almost everybody I know who has an MBA has his or her shingle out and wants to get clients. But really practicing the fundamentals of being the best of what you can be because you know the theory and you're constantly adding value and helping people come to the conclusions for themselves. And because that, that helps, um, helps validate the fact that they are smart people like you know. So here we are, you guys. We got two and a half minutes. Any questions for me before I let you go? Dr. Gephardt, this is Tanya Parker. Yeah, hi, Ms. So, Parker. As you brought up the Evernote, yeah. uh, my question would be as far as our graded papers, the feedback that you provide, I don't know how big of a storage that Evernote holds, but I don't want to put too much information in there to um, basically fill up the memory of it. Is it a cloud? I'm just trying to... Yeah, it's a... If, yeah, if you're using the free Evernote, uh, there is a limited amount of space, but I think you could put hundreds of papers in the free version and not even worry about it. Uh, I pay 
uh, $59 a year and I have unlimited space and I can use it on an unlimited amount of computers so um, you know if if you can afford $60 a year because you're you can justify using $60 worth a year it really would be worth you know paying that annual fee but I was on the free version forever and a day and I never filled it up and I have lots and lots and lots of stuff in my evernote.com so I don't think yeah yeah load it up you're not gonna fill it up and if you do fill it up while you're in our program that's probably telling you that you could justify paying that sixty dollars a year right so yeah I've never filled mine up and I was on the free version for years and years yeah any other questions uh, send them to me via email or give me a call um, I don't get paid by the hour I I, uh, I I teach because I love to make a positive difference and I'm genuinely grateful for this opportunity and privilege to work with each of you so um, I'll do my best to, to help get you guys what you need but I don't know what I don't know unless you tell me so thank you so much for your valuable time ladies and gentlemen I'll see you online have a great day everyone take care